Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is translation and commentary by His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Founder Acharya Aviskam Hare Krishna Chapter 7, Text 2 Yanam te hum sabigyanam idam vaksham yatri shataha yaj kya vane habhuyon yaj kya kavyam avasishyate. Translation I shall now declare unto you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and numinous. This being known, nothing further shall remain for you to know. Purport, complete knowledge includes knowledge of the phenomenal world, of the spirit behind it, and the source of both of them. This is transcendental knowledge. The Lord wants to explain the above mentioned system of knowledge because Arjuna is Krishna's confidential devotee and friend. In the beginning of the fourth chapter, this explanation was given by the Lord and it is again confirmed here. Complete knowledge can be achieved only by the devotee of the Lord in disciplic succession directly from the Lord. Therefore, one should be intelligent enough to know the source of all knowledge, who is the cause of all causes and the only object for meditation in all types of yoga practice. When the cause of all causes becomes known, then everything knowable becomes known and nothing remains unknown. The Vedas, Mundaka Upanishad, say, Kasmin Bhagavo Vigyate Sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati. Jnanam te hamsa vigyanam idam vaksham yase shataha yad gyatvane habhu yonyaj gyatavyam abhashishyate. Prabhupada uses the word, the adjectives, phenomenal and numinous to translate and define the words given here in this verse by Lord Krishna, Jnanam and Vijnanam, which are common enough words in most Indian languages. The uh, translation Prabhupada has given is a little Maybe a little difficult to understand. The word numinous is not a common English word. What Prabhupada is referring to here is knowledge of matter and knowledge of spirit. This is actually knowledge too. From, from the material perspective, from the perspective of living in this material world, actual knowledge means to discriminate between spirit and matter. The essence of all knowledge, the important, there are so many kinds of knowledge on the material platform itself. There are all kinds of research projects going on and on the internet you can find so much information or supposed information about what people suppose to be true, but it's not actually very important. Scientists are trying to understand what is matter at the microcosmic level, at the macrocosmic level. They go deep under the sea, and look out into space, but all this knowledge is not actually important. What is actually important is to understand what is the meaning of life, what is the purpose of life and how we can fulfill it. Just like for instance, to give some example, when you are eating your meal, whatever it may be, Traditional meal in this part of the world is idli, is it? Idli, dosa, sambar, here also. 
coconut chutney and the money palites they probably eat. I don't know, all sorts of kinds of things we don't want to talk about here. But <coughs> different. Whatever it is, it shouldn't be anything Indian. That's the motto of Manipa. Don't speak Indian languages, don't eat Indian food, don't dress like Indians, don't think like Indians, don't worship God. So anyway, when we're eating our food, we don't have to make a scientific analysis of it or try to understand how it's grown. We just have to eat it. If we think that, we have to make a, a biochemical analysis of everything before we eat it, and we'll never eat it. And then we'll start. And similarly, instead of analyzing everything in this world around us, it's more important to understand what is the meaning of life. This is the topic that Krishna is addressing. That's why Bhagavad Gita is the most essential of all the Vedic knowledge. In the Vedas we find all kinds of information concerning this material world. But Krishna, here in Bhagavad Gita, he says in this verse, Yajna, Jnanam Teham Sadhyanam Nidam Vakshyam Yasheshata Yajna that I shall now explain to you that knowledge by knowing which there remains nothing further to be known. If we know that I am spirit soul, I am part and parcel of Krishna, I don't belong to this material world, then we don't really need to know so much about this material world anyway. We don't need to understand about astrology, for instance, because anyway, we don't, we don't live here, we don't, we, 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 don't, we don't belong here. So the real thing is how to get out of this world instead of trying to adjust to living comfortably within it. This is the essence of knowledge being given by Krishna. So this word is jnanam and vijnanam. They're being, of course, different commentators may give different understandings of what these words mean. A vigyan in modern Indian languages is generally uh, understood as science. And Prabhupada often used to say that Krishna consciousness is scientific. Why did Prabhupada say that? Well, one reason is because Krishna consciousness is scientific. Scientific in the sense that it's practical that, for instance, uh, in medicine, I'm, I'm just going to demonstrate my knowledge of medicine here. If someone has a headache, they may prescribe them paracetamol. You see, I'm highly advanced in medical understanding. And generally it works. Not always, but generally if one has a headache and he takes some aspirins or whatever, then the pain goes away, temporarily at least. So we can say that is scientific. It is scientific that this medicine has been discovered and it is prescribed in cases of mild headache. Of course, if one has brain cancer, it won't help very much, but in cases of mild headache, then paracetamol is a temporary, symptomatic treatment. So we can say that is scientific. Or uh, very simple chemistry. If you mix together acid and alkali, then you expect some reaction and some salt will be produced and water. So this is scientific, that if you do it, if you mix any acid with any, well, or the most acids with alkali, you can expect this is what will happen. It's predictable. It follows a system. So in the same way, Krishna consciousness is scientific. 
If you chant Hare Krishna, what will be the effect? Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Eight Krishna Bhag, Jai Jate, Ta Krishna Upajai Bhag. The effect of chanting Hare Krishna is that we will develop love for Krishna. Now you may say, well, that's not quantifiable. But it, it may not be quantifiable in a gross manner. There's no uh, machine to measure bhav. There's no bhavometer. But uh, it is recognizable the symptoms of a person who has developed bhav are described in the Bhakti Shastra. Rupa Goswami Prabhupada has written, he has compiled Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which Prabhupada translated as the nectar of devotion and subtitled The Complete Science of Bhakti Yoga. Because it very, very systematically, systematically he describes what is bhakti, what is the necessity of performing bhakti, what is pure devotional service distinguished from mixed devotional service. What are the effects of performing devotional service? How to perform devotional service? What are the effects of performing devotional service in the correct way and in the incorrect way? Just like if you, if you, uh, if you purchase some instrument and it's not working, there's the troubleshooting guy. But what, what are you doing wrong? So it may say, for instance, well, Flick the on-off button to on. If it's not working, they usually give some simple thing, isn't it? Make sure that it's turned on. They give all the different reasons why it may not be working. So why, if we're not becoming advanced in bhakti, what are the reasons Rupa Goswami gives? So all these things are there. He describes what are the basic characteristics of someone who is developing love of Krishna. Kshanti means not disturbed by any material conditions. And the example he gives is that of Parikshit Maharaj, who was, who got the information, you will die in seven days. He thought, very good. Now I can find out what is the goal of life. I have seven days seven whole days. So let me find out what is the purpose of life. And no, he wasn't disturbed by the curse that he would die. He, he wasn't disturbed by hunger or thirst. He just went on listening to Shukadev Goswami. Then Shantir, Adhyata, Kalabham, one who has developed love for Krishna does not want to waste any time. All time is spent Knowing that time, we have this human form of life, we have to utilize this time. We won't stay very long here. We'll all be gone. Just like you won't be in Manipal very long, most of you. You'll be here and gone. So those who want to make the proper use of their stay in Manipal, they study. You, yeah, that's why people come to Manipal to get a degree. So you study so that you can get the degree and then utilize that elsewhere. So similarly, we won't be in this human body very long. So those who have understood that the purpose of life is to attain Krishna consciousness, they utilize this human form of life, knowing that we won't be here very long. Let us utilize the opportunity. So like this, Rupa Goswami has given uh, different symptoms by which we can recognize love of Krishna. And these symptoms are given throughout Shastra. So in this way, Krishna consciousness is scientific. There is a process. If we follow it, then we get the result. It's not simply a sentiment. But it actually works. If we take to Krishna consciousness seriously, then we will get the result, which is simply defined as bhakti 
Freshanda Bhava Virakti Ranyatra. That we develop, we experience Krishna. And concomitantly we become detached from everything else. This is the, these are the symptoms of Krishna consciousness. And those who take to Krishna consciousness can actually experience Krishna in their lives. There are so many uh, innumerable examples of this that it's not simply uh, an imagination. If it was simply something imagined, then it wouldn't last. As Krishna uh, very how can we say poignantly describes in Bhagavad Gita Nasato Vidyate Bhavo Na Bhava Vidyate Sataha That which is real is lasting. That which is faith it won't last. We see in the modern age there are so many self-made gurus. The popular thing at the present time is to take some things from some stress management courses and so-called self-improvement courses, mix it up with a few quotes from the Upanishads, grow a long beard, declare oneself a guru and cheat people in this way. But this kind of thing will not last because it has no basis in Vigyan, scientific knowledge of the Absolute Truth. It's on the material platform. Even though they may quote from the Upanishads, the spirit of the Upanishads is not there. We don't find in these, these kind of gurus who teach how you can cope with material life. They do not have the spirit of Nachike, who was offered by Yamaraj. You take anything in the world, he was... Nachike was asking, you give me Atma Gyan. Yamaraj said, don't ask for this, I'll give you anything in the world you want. He said, no, I only want this. So the modern self-made gurus who are saying that you do a little meditation and you quote, you quote, sing a few bhajans and you adjust to material life and in this way you go on and become a success in material life. They have not got the spirit of the Shastra. The spirit of the Shastra, the spirit of the Rishis, is not how to live comfortably in this material world, but to understand as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described that this material world is like a pit into which people pass through. Now, in modern life, we have it very scientifically organized that we pass stool in a water flush toilet and it get flushed, gets flushed into some, into some pipes and then it gets all, goes through the sewers. Of course in India they don't do all this. But in the West they have all these, they have an elaborate underground city of sewers. Very elaborate system. And all the sewers come to a water purification plant and then all the sewage, that means the, sewage is a polite term for stool and urine, it all gets uh, processed chemically and then the water goes back into the houses as tap water for cooking and drinking with. Isn't that wonderful? Advancement of modern science. So anyway, previously people weren't so technologically advanced, so they used to go outside the village and pass through in a pit in a hole, and it still goes on in some places. So you can imagine that that hole is not very pleasant, it stinks. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, the whole material world is like a hole into which people pass through. So that's not very nice. 
I have my wife, my children, my apartment, my TV, my mixing, my washing machine, my dog, my cat. Everything is nice. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says it is like a pit into which people pass through. There's nothing pleasant about it. So understanding this, the Rishi, those who are actually Rishi, they did not strive for material advancement. Nowadays we think our modern society is very advanced. We have so many technological facilities. But they are technological facilities for spoiling our lives. You may think that why, you see India is very backward, you have to learn from the West because they have so much technological advancement in the West. And in India we were just living like savages, no electricity, no flush toilets. Now we're very advanced, everyone has a cell phone. But the standard of civilization in India was different. That they didn't consider material advancement to be very important. <coughs> they had material advancement in another way. <coughs> Otherwise, why was it that the British, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, they were all sailing to India? Why didn't they stay at home? Why were they coming to India? Going around Africa. And they came to India and they thought, who will have India? Because India was so rich. But the actual wealth, the materially rich, they had so much gold, silver, jewels, silk, so many valuable things. Even materially, India was so rich that the Europeans took a lot of trouble to come here. But the real wealth of India, they didn't, they were too gross to find it out. Dull headed, just interested in material things. The real wealth of India is her spiritual culture. And modern Indians have now become so dull headed that they don't recognize that either. They think if we can get some, uh, some more money by, by working, we say working like a donkey, it's actually not a very good example because a donkey would refuse to work as hard as most people do nowadays. So it's, it's, you can say that modern man is ultra donkey, super donkey. They have all these movies, Batman, Spider-Man, but in reality the people who are watching it, they are donkey man. That's all. Super donkey. They get two hours a week free after working like a super donkey and then they waste their time going to some Spider-Man movie. So uh, they're so foolish, just like a donkey. Donkey, why we say donkey? Don because donkey, they do a lot of hard work and uh, they have no higher intelligence. But they think, I am, uh, donkey thinks himself to be a great philosopher. Donkey also speaks philosophy. You've heard the donkey? Very loudly. <laughs> Have you heard the donkey? They start off very loud and then they just fade away. Because who cares to listen to a donkey? So big philosopher, very proud, yes! But in the end... <laughs> so modern donkey-like civilization. To call modern man donkey, it's actually... is not an insult to the human being, it's an insult to the donkey. So... They have no higher intelligence to consider what is the actual purpose of life. They have no higher intelligence to consider what is the value of this culture. Just like all these students, they come to Manipal and they are next to the one of the best seats of traditional spiritual culture in the world. 
but they're more interested in illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and gambling. Do they gamble here? Not so much. Definitely the other three. Lots of freedom, lots of money, and lots of foolishness. It's a very bad combination. So they don't consider that they think, oh, we're getting higher knowledge, M-I-A-G, Manipal Institute of Higher Education. The real higher education is to understand Krishna. But they're, they're saying that this higher education is how to become a big shudra. You get, oh, now I've got my degree. Now, now I can go and get a job. Please give me a job. Paying lots of money. 14,000 rupees a month. You only have to work 80 hours a week. Earn lots of money. So that when you've worked hard for 20 years, when you get a heart attack, you can have a bypass in money part. Bypass surgery. In a five-star air-conditioned hospital. But it costs a lot of money, so you have to save your money so you can pay for your bypass surgery. Then you can tell everyone, oh, I had a bypass surgery. Apollo Hospital. Highly prestigious. People are foolish. They do not know what the purpose of life is. They cannot asset, they cannot see what the real meaning of life is. So foolish that even though they're actually completely frustrated, but they so foolish they can't even recognize that. Isn't it? In in Manipal? People are totally frustrated. Their nerves are completely jangled out, but they, uh, they can't understand that life is not meant to be like this. There's a higher purpose in life. So Krishna is teaching this scientific knowledge. This is real science. But we have no sagacity to begin to inquire into this. We are just pulled around. We are told, you should study, work, get a good job. We are, t we, we are told, you should wear fashionable clothes. To be in, to be acceptable socially, you have to dress in a certain way, you have to act really cool, you have to drive around on a motorbike, and you have to do all these things. We're just, just donkeys. No one is thinking. No one is thinking, actually, how should I live? Just whatever we get from the TV and the movies, and just we see other people behave like that, and we think, I should also behave like that. He's the number one fool, supposedly intelligent, but number one fool. Because you can't actually think for yourself at all. Just because you're... You, Others want you to act like this and dress like this. And actually it's all a scam from all the companies that want you to buy their products, that's all. So, and you do so. Why should anyone drink Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola? Why should you drink it? It doesn't taste very good. Does anyone think it tastes very good? Of course, a long time since I drunk it. But it's, uh, people only drink it because it's advertised. If you just left it in the shop without any advertisement, no one would ever buy it. But because they advertise that it's somehow considered fashionable or something to drink it, therefore only people buy it, isn't it? So that just shows there's no benefit from drinking it. It doesn't even taste nice. It's not at all good for health. But because they advertise that, yeah, it's something, I don't know how they advertise it, but whatever. Well, they show the sports stars are drinking it or something. And so you want to drink it. This just shows how people are so foolish. So this pressure conscious movement is based on Bhagavad Gita as it is. And it's, 
It's meant to make people actually intelligent. Sometimes people accuse us of brainwashing. When people take to Krishna consciousness, other people say, oh, they're being brainwashed. Do you hear that sometimes? People say that? Yes, no? You mean brainwashed. So this accusation came in 1977 in America. And Prabhupada, he's, when this accusation came, he said, yes, we are brainwashing. Your brain requires to be washed because it is full of stool. It is not clean. Your brain is full of all dirty things. He said, actually, we're not brainwashing, we are brain-giving. You have no brain. <laughs> that is a fact. People are spoiling their lives without cons They don't even stop once to think, what is the purpose of life? Actually, on that point, I, just, I was just reading something today. They generally think that the brain is connected with intelligence. Right? But there, there was one neurosurgeon who he came across several people without brains who were very intelligent. You know about that? <laughs> one person, he had only, the brain was just, the brain cavity was just full of water. And there was gray matter, about 2% of normal, and he had 120 IQ. <laughs> so, there are so many things actually which defy the modern scientific, so it's modern scientific paradigms. But whenever any such thing comes up, the scientists just ignore it. And that's all. What they call science is just cheating. Just like this uh, devotee in. Mangalore is dying of cancer. So they say that there is no cure for cancer because they can give chemotherapy. But the, uh, the cure is almost as bad as the disease. But there are no naturopathic methods of treatment. But they don't accept them and they don't allow. If you want to give natural treatment, they won't allow it. They say it's not scientific, but damn it, it works. It is scientific. I mean, you don't understand it because you're a fool with your big degree, MBBS and all. You don't, it doesn't fit within your system. It's just, but they, they therefore refuse to accept that they, it works, although there are hundreds of cases all over the world of it working. Different cures for cancer by natural methods. But they refuse to accept it because they can't explain it. They say, no, no, it doesn't work. But it does work. What it means is that actually they are, they are fools, is what it actually means. They don't know and they refuse to accept because they cannot explain it. And they don't want to explain it because they want that their system only should, of injecting chemicals, this should, only this should work. They refused because this natural healing is based on traditional medicine and the traditional systems of medicine are rooted in ancient cultures, whereas the modern system of medicine is based on scientific research. Now, they don't want to accept the, the natural system working because then they have to admit that there is something of value in the ancient cultures which they want to, they don't want to accept them because their idea is that modern man is the apex of development and that ancient cultures had no real knowledge. They want to say that real knowledge began with scientific investigation in the modern age. Modern, real knowledge began with Galileo and Copernicus and then what? and especially in the 19th century and in the 20th century, this, this is knowledge. 
इनाम वक्षाम यशेशित यज क्या गाने का बोलियों ने यज क्या कर दिया मैं विशेषित हूँ। They want to say that what they call modern science, this is knowledge, and outside of this there is nothing to be known. But it's a proven fact again and again that natural systems of of medicine work, whereas the modern scientific methods don't work. So that's actually scientific, but they can't explain it, and they don't even want to admit it because then they would have to admit that their whole whole paradigm, that modern man with modern developed scientific knowledge, is the apex of of human development, and anything prevenient to this was was simply just all mumbo jumbo, but. Actually, in the West, what's happening is that many, many people you can see on the internet. There's a lot of these things. They don't accept what they don't accept the modern paradigm. What they're taught in school, what is the what is scientific orthodoxy? Many, many people they don't accept it there, because there are so many phenomena. That cannot be explained by modern science, and therefore, instead of explaining it, they just say it doesn't exist. A common example is that of UFOs, which I'm not much interested in UFOs, but th- there is a huge amount, of, so many sightings, and but and, and they just try to explain it away in terms of some cloud or some. Airplane, but there are so many instances they just they can't explain it, and there has been scientifically conducted research into reincarnation done in a scientific way by accredited scholars, but they just ignore it. They don't want to accept it. But but there is a huge. You'll find the internet is full of all kinds of things like. Crop circles and all kinds of things, which can't be explained by modern in, by modern science, and they just try to ignore it. But the the many people, especially in America and Britain and Germany, they、uh, they are themselves independently researching all these things. There are so many things. There's、uh, so many things. There's one whole phenomena which is never reported in the newspapers of people dying. It's it happens fairly often in the West. They die how their body just catches on fire. It's not they they don't pour on kerosene. They just all of a sudden they burn to death. The fire comes from within, like as is described in Shastra. Yogis used to do that. So it, it's. There are many, many cases where the, the 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 doctors come and the fire brigade come, and only the body is burned, and there's nothing around it. There's nothing else is burned. There's no matches. There's nothing. There's no suicide note. It's it happens again and again. But there are people documenting these things, but it won't get reported in the newspaper like that. But some firemen who have seen this more than once, they've spoken, and they can see it's something amazing. There's no cause for the fire. There's no external cause. So, and this is just one example of many. There are many, many things which modern science cannot explain because they want to remain. Within certain parameters, they don't want to accept that there is adhoksha jagyan, knowledge which is coming from beyond the platform of pratyaksha and anuman. This is the modern scientific platform. What we can see, what we can measure, and what we can extrapolate. Usually by mathematics, from our seeing, then we consider this to be scientific, 
And anything else, we don't accept as knowledge. Even if we see it, if we can't explain it, we ignore it. This is not scientific. What is going on in the name of science is actually not science. It's cheating. Much of it is cheating. Just like you see this, the cure for cancer. They won't teach this. It's, it's well known among naturopaths that uh, for cancer, if one takes, especially in the early stages, if one drinks lots of wheatgrass juice, freshly made wheatgrass juice, continuously drink, 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 that will cure it. It's well known. But they will never tell you this in the hospital. In, in the medical college, they'll never tell you this. Why? Well, because anyone can do that. You don't need a doctor then, do you? Where will their business go? Not only that, but even more so, their, their whole outlook is one that you need chemicals. They don't accept that simply by, by diet and herbs one can be cured. Why? It's just pig-headed ignorance, if you want to know. We don't need to use any fancy Latin term. It's just pig-headed ignorance, that's all. Stubborn rascal. So I'm just saying all these things. It's, uh, you may say, well, it's got nothing to do with Krishna consciousness. Not directly. But because of this ethos in modern society in which they, they presume that matter is all in all and that we know what's going on, that we science by science, we know what's going on and we're making a better world by making different, more advanced cell phones and better TVs and more jobs and more factories. The world is getting better. They're advertising like this. People are in illusion. Anyway, people are illusion in this material world. But modern society is increasing the illusion by advertising that life is enjoyable simply by working hard and getting money and wearing fashionable clothes and drinking Pepsi and this is it. So this is, it is this illusion which is deflecting us away from the real purpose of life which is akato brahma jivnyasa to inquire into the absolute truth to find out that knowledge by knowing which nothing else shall remain to be known. And what is that knowledge? It's very simple. Jiva Saro Pai Krishna Nitya We don't belong to this material world. We belong to Krishna. We are eternal servants of Krishna. Life is meant for understanding Krishna. There's nothing in this world of any importance but attaining Krishna. We may say, well, what about getting food, that's important. What about having a place to live, that's important. It's only important in as much as it facilitates becoming Krishna conscious. Otherwise it's of no importance. Of no importance. There's nothing of any value in this world. Even religion is useless. If it's not aimed at Krishna. And even religion aimed at Krishna but meant for ex extracting something from Krishna. Just like people come here, they pray to Krishna, give me this, give me that. We are not teaching. We are not teaching, go to Krishna and loot him. Let's go. Pocket Mara, Krishna. Pickpocket Krishna. We're not preaching. It. Get from Krishna. No. Krishna conscious means to surrender to Krishna. To come to our constitutional position. This is not ordinary religion. That's why we find even religious parents who are dying species in India. They, they, are, uh, they are not usually very happy when their children want to take to Krishna Conscious 
as we are preaching. They say, no, no, you just worship Krishna at home. You be a donkey, but be a Krishna conscious donkey. But there's no such thing. One cannot be Krishna conscious and at the same time aspire for material improvement. The two things don't go together. So actually this, uh, the educational authorities here, they should throw us out from all their programs. They shouldn't allow us to preach because we're going to spoil the children. We're going to spoil the students by teaching them that the actual goal of life is nothing that MIHE can give you or whatever it is, whatever high institution it may be, high in, whoops, don't insult them. So, uh, they, it may be considered very prestigious, but they cannot give you the real goal of life. Actually, they can do now that they're inviting us. But we also shouldn't be compromised by their mundane way of thinking. Krishna conscious means to understand Krishna, to surrender to Krishna, to go beyond whatever this material world has to offer. Whatever this material world has to offer is simply stool. It flies. There's no, this material world is just like a pit into which people pass stool. So all of it. If we say that these educational institutions, they're like stool, you may think, well, that's very insulting. But we say, no, it's not only the educational institutions here that are like stools, but everything in this material world. It's all non-relishable, except for pigs. Anything devoid of the sense of surrender to Krishna is not only a waste of time, but it is anartha. It is an obstruction on the path of attaining the real need for the jiva, which is to surrender to Krishna. I'm going to finish there because we only have 15 minutes or so left. If there's any question, comment, or protest, please voice it now. Hmm. How can you be Krishna conscious? Well, chant Hare Krishna, take Krishna Prasad, study Prabhupada's books. Yeah, go on. Might as well, seeing as you're here. Might as well because at least one reason is if you don't, there'll be so much pressure from others. It's easier to go on with the studies than not to do so. If you don't do, then you'll get so much harassment. It's easier to do it. Just do it. Chant Hare Krishna also. Any other? No other points? Then we can have a little kirtan.